What would the FromSoft games be without their world design? As much as we love the combat, the boss fights, and the lore, the overall layout of the worlds in these games really is the glue that holds them together. However, some of these games definitely handle this aspect better than others, so I figured I'd rank their world layouts from worst to best. As for the criteria, the main things I'll be considering are interconnectivity, meaning how all the different areas of the world connect to each other, how many options you have, meaning the less linear, the better, overall cohesion, which refers to the world feeling organic and like the areas aren't forced together in a way that breaks the game's immersion, plus a few bonus points for the world being well done lore-wise or having nice visual variety. And one thing that I need to make very clear before jumping into this is that I'm going to try my best to not consider the quality of the individual areas in each game. For example, even if I think a game literally has perfect areas, with good level design, fun gameplay, and cool aesthetics, if those areas just form a straight line from the beginning to the end without any any diverging paths, then that game would end up at the bottom. And as usual, remember that this is just my opinion. Also, I don't think any of these games have bad world design, it's just that some do it better than others. So with all that out of the way, let's begin. Number 7, Dark Souls 3. Like I said, I don't think any of these worlds are bad. In fact, there's a lot to like about the land of Lothric in Dark Souls 3. First and foremost, this game has absolutely no issues when it comes to cohesion. Transitioning from one area to another is usually pretty smooth and feels as though these are real places that could actually exist, as opposed to just being a bunch of levels awkwardly forced together. And one of the main things that really helps it sell this idea is the fact that there are so many places where you can see other areas in the distance. Like, the fact that you can see the Grand Archives, which is one of the final areas in the game, the moment you walk into High Wall of Lothric is so cool. And for what it's worth, I guess it's kinda neat the way you return to High Wall after defeating three of the four lords so that you can progress to Lothric Castle. Or if you want, you can attempt to fight the dancer early in the game and just get to the castle whenever you want, though I definitely wouldn't recommend it. So while Dark Souls 3's world isn't devoid of upsides, I have to address the elephant in the room and the main reason why it's at the bottom. This is the most linear game in the series. Now that's not to say that there aren't a few diverging paths. Early in the game you have to take a detour to Cathedral of the Deep, you can find the optional area Smoldering Lake from the Catacombs, and in the late game there's the option of going to Untended Graves and Archdragon Peak. But aside from visiting those areas, and obviously the DLCs, there really just aren't that many different ways to approach Dark Souls 3. If you really want to split hairs, you could say that you have the decision of whether you want to fight Aldrich or Yorm first, but all in all, out of every game in the series, this just feels like the one where most players are guaranteed to have a relatively similar experience. While the individual areas in this game tend to have good level design with a fair amount of options, if you look at the world as a whole, there just isn't much intrigue in comparison to the other FromSoft games. So while I don't necessarily dislike this game's world, I just think that the best aspects of this game tend to lie in the consistency and the boss fights rather than the overall layout. Number 6, Demon Souls. Now, I'm sure a lot of you were expecting this one to be dead last by default, just due to the fact that this is the only game in the series that doesn't have an actual connected world. Instead, the main hub area just teleports you to the five different archstones, which each have two to four areas within them, and obviously the game does lose a few points because of this. Since the areas here really are just separate contained levels with a beginning and an end, the game doesn't have any opportunity to show off the classic interconnecting or looping paths that connect different areas in unexpected ways, which did make me consider putting this game at the bottom. However, I have to give some credit to the fact that this is arguably the least linear game in the series. After beating the first area of the first archstone, you are instantly granted access to all of the other four archstones. Meaning once the first level is out of the way, you could literally just go to the final archstone and kill all three bosses in it before even completing the second level of Boletarian Palace. Also, once you've fully completed any of the last four archstones, you're free to venture through the final two areas of the Boletarian Palace, meaning you can literally beat the final boss of the game and still have almost three-fifths of content left to do. That's a hell of a lot of freedom for the player. Plus, for what it's worth, I like that each of the different archstones are vastly different in terms of environment and aesthetics, which gives the game a good amount of visual variety in both the original and the remake. And the way the Nexus works, requiring you to defeat the archdemons so you can travel below and lull the old one back to slumber is pretty satisfying and well done. So overall, while I personally don't think that Demon's Souls is deserving of a particularly high spot on the list, just due to its unconnected nature, I still think its unique style is worth some recognition, as it does offer benefits that aren't present in the other games. 
Number 5, Dark Souls 2. Finding a proper placement for this one was a bit tricky. Once again, this game's world has a few flaws that I think would cause a lot of people to say it belongs near the bottom, but at the same time, it does handle some aspects really well. Without a doubt, the best thing about this game's world is how many options you have from the very start. You can make your way to Forest of the Fallen Giants or Hyde's Tower of Flame, and after some simple steps, you could also head to the Shaded Woods, Huntsman's Copse, the Grave of Saints, or the first two DLCs not long after. While this game certainly doesn't have the same level of interconnectivity as Dark Souls 1, it still does a good job at making it feel like you have a lot of ways to approach things in the first half, even though the paths that actually lead to the four old ones are generally pretty linear, aside from the Lost Sinner. It's also cool that if you want, you can actually just choose to not kill any of the old ones and go through the effort of reaching 1 million soul memory in order to move on to Drangleic Castle. And from there, I think it's satisfying how you use the King Ring to reach previously inaccessible areas, which then leads to using the Ashen Mist Heart to reach the Giant Memories. In addition, this game has a solid amount of visual variety since you get to visit lots of areas that are vastly different in terms of environment, especially in the DLCs. Also as a side note, I'm kind of 50-50 on the Fragrant Branches of Yore mechanic, since on your first playthrough especially, it can feel pretty shitty if you run out and don't know where to find more, but overall I still think it was a cool way of making this game's progression feel unique. So, while Dark Souls 2's world does have some cool things going for it, and gives you a fun sense of adventure along the way, it does unfortunately have a few key flaws holding it back from the top half of the list. And easily the most obvious complaint is the game's lack of realistic cohesion. It kind of feels like slapping a dead horse at this point, since everyone and their grandma has made fun of this, but the transition from Earthen Peak to Iron Keep, where you somehow ride an elevator from the top of a windmill, up to a lava fortress that also has a completely different sky box really takes me out of the game. While this is definitely the biggest offender, there are also a few other weird moments like when you ride the ship from No Man's Wharf to Lost Bastille. As much as I give Dark Souls 3 shit for being too linear, there's never a moment in that game where I feel like the immersion of the world is broken, with the main thing backing that up being the fact that you can often see other areas in the distance. But in Dark Souls 2, it's very obvious that they had to cut corners in order to make the world lay out how they wanted it. Plus, one positive that every game above this one has is the feeling of interconnectivity. Now, there are a few moments where Dark Souls 2 has some paths that cross each other like in the Lost Bastille, but most of the time, the game basically just gives you a bunch of differing levels to complete that all lead to dead ends where you get a key item or resource. So, while I do get a lot of enjoyment from the world of Drangleic and Dark Souls 2, I just feel like the top 4 spots are generally more solid and feel more organically put together. Number 4, Bloodborne. I think Bloodborne perfectly represents the average quality for a From Software world. It doesn't quite have the same high highs of their best worlds, but there's still a lot to love and not too much to criticize. After making your way through Central Yharnam and getting into Cathedral Ward, the game begins to give you a lot of choices on how you'd like to progress. You can head to Old Yharnam and kill the Blood starved beast to open the hunter's workshop, or you can just use the hunter chief emblem if you killed cleric beast in order to head straight for Vicar Amelia. Either way, once the upper half of the ward is unlocked, you're given a lot of freedom from there. You can head to Hemwick Charnel Lane, go to Yahar Ghoul early by getting caught by a snatcher, or find your way to the Forbidden Woods upon defeating Amelia. Plus, defeating Amelia is also what gives you access to the DLC, which is particularly helpful to visit early on in this game. And of course, if you've completed Hemwick Charnel Lane and opened the Forbidden Woods, then you've basically already got a free pass to Kanehurst Castle. But don't forget, if you acquire the Tonsil Stone from the woods, then you can also head to the Nightmare Frontier early. I could keep going, but I think you all get the point. This game gives you a surprising amount of freedom, despite its world design seeming relatively straightforward at a first glance. And as usual, being the unapologetic Bloodborne fan that I am, I've gotta give credit to how well the lore is implemented in the progression of the world. Gaining more insight as you progress, and being able to see things that you couldn't initially is such an awesome feature. Also, the fact that you can get captured and go to Yahar Ghoul early, hearing the creepy chanting of the School of Mensis as they try to summon a Great One, and then come back after defeating Rom to find all of the members dead after they ascended to the Nightmare is so horrifyingly cool. And speaking of the Nightmare areas, despite the fact that there appears to be no rhyme or reason to them, the game actually gives you a lot of small ways that you can try and piece together how the Nightmare is layered. There's that spot from the Nightmare Frontier where you can see ship masts from Fishing Hamlet below, and from Fishing Hamlet you can also see buildings from the hunter's nightmare beneath it. 
While the game never directly explains how these Nightmare Realms work, it gives you just enough information to fill in some of the blanks on your own. And like the best of FromSoft's worlds, there's also a few places where paths loop around and take you back to previous areas. Though I will admit, in this game the interconnections often don't feel super useful. Like, I highly doubt there were any players who pissed their pants in excitement upon seeing that Parl's boss arena leads back to old Yarnum. Now, if I were to dig up a few negative aspects of this world, the first one would be that there is a slight lack of direct on your first playthrough. On my initial run, I remember being genuinely stumped a few times, since the game doesn't directly tell you certain things like defeating Bloodstarved Beast opening the workshop, or defeating Amelia giving you the password to Forbidden Woods. I also have to admit that there is a slight shortage of visual variety, since a lot of the game has a similar feeling of dark lighting to it. But overall, these are just nitpicks, and not enough to really bring down the quality of the world in my eyes. Altogether, I think Bloodborne checks most of the boxes for what is expected of a world layout made by FromSoft, while also having a bit of its own flair due to the awesome way that it implements lore into how your journey changes as it goes on. Definitely not the best, but far from the worst. Number 3, Sekiro. I'm not sure if many people will agree with this, but I really think Sekiro has one of the better worlds that FromSoft has concocted. Out of every game on the list, I feel like this one is definitely the smallest overall, but that's also kind of a good thing since it feels like there isn't any wasted space. And similarly to the previous two games, it just revels in giving you that beautiful feeling of almost always having multiple choices for where you'd like to go next. Super early on, you're given the choice of just going going to Hirata Estate whenever you want. Furthermore, once you complete Ashina Outskirts and make it to Ashina Castle, you instantly have the ability to reach three different corners of the world at your fingertips. And I think Ashina Castle does an amazing job at basically being the center of the world. Plus, it obviously helps that as an area by itself, it has really good level design, because it makes the three different pathways leading out of it feel totally natural, and almost a bit difficult to find if you aren't willing to look around enough. I actually remember getting a bit lost in this area on my first playthrough, after finishing Sempo Temple, but as long as you're always willing to explore, you'll be continuously rewarded for your efforts. Speaking of which, one of the main things that really gives this game's world an edge is all of its unique movement mechanics, with the obvious standout being the grappling hook. Since this game easily gives you the most freedom of movement in the series, it gave FromSoft the ability to create some insanely niche and well-hidden secrets. There are so many random pathways between areas that I had no idea even existed for the longest time, such as the route that goes from Ashina outskirts all the way to the Demon Bell in Sempo Temple. Or that spot in Sempo where you can raise a kite and grapple from it to find a sneaky hidden path into Sunken Valley where you can defeat the snake there. Or you could also just let the snake swallow you and it will take you on a trip down to the Sunken Valley Cave. I also think the Shinobi shortcuts were a great addition. They could provide you with a lot of hidden rooms full of useful items, or even some weird pathways like the one that goes from the top of Ashina Castle all the way back to the dilapidated temple. Call me crazy, but it feels to me like when they initially started making this game, they might have actually planned to make it like Dark Souls 1, where you aren't able to fast travel, but they eventually scrapped the idea in favor of shifting their focus onto other elements of the game. It would have been awesome to see this actually work out, though it is still really cool as it is. But there's also another major aspect of Sekiro that deserves a lot of recognition, which is how the game's world slowly changes as time goes on. After completing the three mid-game paths, suddenly all of the checkpoints in Ashina Castle just become inaccessible aside from the one leading into the dungeon. And when you come back to it, you see that it's started to be invaded by the Ministry. So now the enemy placements of the area are completely shifted around, basically turning it into a new level that you have to conquer all over again, which is also aided by the fact that you now have the ability to swim underwater, giving you access to sections that you couldn't explore beforehand. And after returning to it from Fountainhead Palace, it turns into an all-out war zone zone, plus it now has a more direct connection to Ashina Outskirts, which becomes its own optional late game area where you go through it backwards, leading to the Demon of Hatred fight. Furthermore, after defeating Great Shinobi Owl, you're given access to a quest line with Emma, which allows you to return to Hirata Estate and see what happened to it after your initial defeat. While I'm sure this method of reusing areas may be a downside to some, it honestly doesn't bother me one bit, since the changes made turn them into a different experience from what they were initially. Except maybe Hirata, but at least it comes with the best optional boss in the game. Besides, it's kind of difficult for me to see this as much of a downside when I personally consider Sekiro to have the overall best area quality in the series. And the visual variety throughout this world is breathtaking. Sure, in the Ashina areas, there can be a bit of repetition with the snow and the similar looking buildings, but when you have views for your eyes to feast on like the giant statues of Sunken Valley, the breathtaking color palette of Sempo Temple, or just 
Fountainhead Palace. For me, this game has no issue with visuals. Overall, I can't really think of any downsides to this game's world design. If I had to muster up a complaint, I guess the grappling hook maybe had a bit more potential? Like, while the drop into Ashina Depths is super cool, it kind of makes me think that they could have tried to have more moments like this. But even as it is, I think Sekiro's world is beautifully put together and well deserving of a spot in the top three. Number 2, Dark Souls 1. While I do think that there's a lot to love about the bottom 5 spots on this list, the top 2 just go so far and beyond in terms of world layout that it almost makes the rest of them feel like an afterthought in comparison. Ever since Dark Souls 1 was released, it has pretty unanimously been considered the gold standard by which every other FromSoft game's world is judged. It's kind of hard to decide where to begin, so I guess I'll start by mentioning the most important reason why this game's world is as good as it is, that being the fact that you aren't allowed to fast travel in the first half. Now, for many newcomers to the series, I know that this sounds really unappealing since it does sacrifice a bit of convenience, but the upsides are more than worth it. Because you aren't allowed to just instantly teleport wherever you want, you're able to get so much more immersed in the level design. And when you combine this with the fact that the bonfires are a bit more scarce in this game compared to the others, it creates a way more exciting gameplay loop where instead of constantly trying to find a bunch of different checkpoints, you're more focused on simply trying to find shortcuts that lead back to the bonfires you've already acquired so you can get as much out of them as possible. There's a good reason why every time a new FromSoft game is announced, tons of fans of the series hope for it to be the next one that starts with no fast travel, because it makes the exploration so much more satisfying. But of course, it wouldn't be as helpful as it is if it weren't for the fact that this game has the best interconnection in the series. Aside from the number one spot, the feeling of freedom you have in this game's world is unrivaled. The moment you're dropped into Firelink Shrine, you could head to the catacombs for some late game items, go to New Londo Ruins for some other useful tools, find your way up to Undead Burg, which is the regular route, or if you have the master key, you could head to Blight Town or make your way through the Darkroot Basin Cave to access the back end of the early game levels. While some of the lower spots on the list also have a bit of that feeling of freedom, the main thing that sets this game apart is how all of these differing paths don't just lead to dead ends. They almost always find a way to lead you back to another part of the world in some way or another. And I love how based on the route you take, it's very possible to miss huge chunks of the game like I did on my first playthrough. Since I found the cave in Darkroot Basin, which leads right to the backside of Blight Town, I actually didn't even know that Lower Undead Burg or the Depths existed until my second playthrough. There's also a bunch of various upsides this game has, such as being among the best in terms of seeing other areas in the distance, and having well-hidden secret levels like Ash Lake or the Painted World. Now, when we get to the second half of the game, it admittedly isn't as impressive, but all in all, I still like the way it's structured. Normally, this would be the part where I discuss how the areas in the second half aren't as good as those in the first. But that's not what we're talking about today, and I think it's cool how you have the choice of what order you'd like to obtain the Lord Souls in. Weirdly enough, the second half of this game is kind of like the first half of Dark Souls 2, where after placing the Lord Vessel to open up the previously blocked paths, you just go off in four different directions to defeat the major endgame bosses. And I like how it all comes together culminating underneath Firelink Shrine, since it feels like the game ends at the same place where it started. Now, if I were to give this world one nitpick, there is a chance that the game can be a bit too punishing before unlocking fast travel. If you were like me on my first playthrough and thought that going to the end of the Tomb of the Giants before obtaining the Lord Vessel was a good idea, then... I'm sorry. That trek back to the top of the catacombs is not fun. But when looking at this game's world and what it was able to achieve, it's just hard to not have a ton of respect for it. I still have yet to play a game with a world that's as tightly put together as this one. However, number one, Elden Ring. While Dark Souls 1's world is definitely more perfect at what it's set out to do, the highs of Elden Ring are so high and frequent that I just couldn't help but put it at the top. Now, obviously, open world games aren't for everyone, and there are plenty of people out there who argue that this game's openness makes it hard for them to get into. But if you are willing to dive into it, I think Elden Ring has the most rewarding world from software has ever designed. It's unquestionably one of the most well-put-together open worlds I've seen in a game. I love how the 
moment you step out into Limgrave, the first proper legacy dungeon isn't actually too far away, but you also have the option of exploring the entirety of Limgrave and a lot of Kaelid before even facing off against Margit. Or if you want, you could literally just skip Stormvale Castle entirely and move on to Liurnia. Honestly, one of the coolest things about this game in general is just how much of the content in it is completely optional. You know how I mentioned in Dark Souls 1 that it's neat how you have the ability to miss an area or two on your first run? Well, in Elden Ring, you could literally miss out on an entire region of the map. I just love how FromSoft has the balls to hide some of the best content in their game and risk a lot of players missing out on it. The entire Volcano Manor area is hidden behind an illusory wall, Mikola's Halleck Tree can only be reached if you do this puzzle to get to it, plus that's assuming that you already found the two medallion pieces that take you to the Consecrated Snowfield. And of course, finding that elevator that takes you all the way down to Siofra River, where you realize that there's an entire underground section of the map, is possibly one of the best moments in the game. Not to mention how you get to Nokron by following Ronnie's questline. But probably the single best thing about Elden Ring's world is the freedom of the level design. Now, like I said in the intro, my goal here is not to put an emphasis on the quality of the areas themselves, but overall, the feeling of walking into a new area and thinking, I can literally go everywhere that I see, is one of the most satisfying things I've ever felt as a fan of this series. It's just so unbelievable how many layers upon layers there are to these locations. While I absolutely love the shit out of areas, areas like An Orlando in Dark Souls 1 or the Ring City in Dark Souls 3, they always just had that slight feeling of disappointment. Like, yeah, this place is super cool, but I kinda wish I could actually get to explore more of it. Obviously, I understand why those areas were the way they were, since they're part of games that are meant to be a more focused experience, and I'm not necessarily saying that I would change them if I could. But Elden Ring just managed to scratch that itch that I had for so long, and I'll never forget it for that. While previous games in the series were more or less just a bunch of random pathways that conveniently lead to interesting locations throughout a world, this game is the first time that we've truly seen a From Software world built from the ground up which in some ways makes it the most immersive game they've concocted. It's also cool how the game often gives you multiple methods of being able to progress from one place to the next, with one of my favorite examples being how you get to Altus Plateau. You could do the normal method and get the two medallions to raise the lift, you could go through the cave nearby it, or you could also just let yourself get abducted in Raya Lucaria, which takes you to Volcano Manor and leads to a spot where you can head over to Altus. And while a lot of people argue that the random caves and such in this game can get a bit repetitive, well, I kind of agree, but I still get a lot of fun from finding all the hidden spots where you unexpectedly find cave entrances. Also, when it comes to visual variety, this game has no equal. Not only are there lots of different environments to explore, but 90% of the time they also look absolutely phenomenal. Now, with all that being said, obviously the world isn't perfect, and in my eyes, the biggest con is that for people like me who replay these games to death, it feels like it may be a little too big after a while. Replay value in general is something that I've always felt a bit conflicted on with this game, because on one hand, re-exploring this game in different ways can be a lot of fun, and I mean a lot of fun. Plus, if you do feel like you're getting bored, my advice would be to go for a mage build, since I think it makes the exploration way more satisfying. But at the same time, out of every game in the series, this one undoubtedly loses the most luster after your first run. On subsequent playthroughs, you don't quite get that same feeling of wanting to level up as much as possible and explore every nook and cranny, which definitely takes away a little bit of the game's appeal, leading to the redundant feeling of spending too much time simply riding around from place to place. And I will also admit that the exploration falls off a little by the time you get to Mountaintops of the Giants, since it starts to rely too much on reused enemies. Now, obviously, Shadow of the Erd Tree could turn this game on its head and make it the best in the series by far, but for now, it is how it is. At the end of the day, I think Elden Ring is a monumental achievement of gaming, and I believe that the world and exploration is the strongest aspect of the game. While there is definitely an argument that Dark Souls 1's world is superior since it's more perfectly put together and favors replay value more, I think that the lands between of Elden Ring are responsible for the most impressive and memorable moments that this series has ever seen in terms of overall layout, which is why I consider it to have the best world design in the series. And holy shit, I cannot wait for Shadow of the Erd Tree. It's been cooking for so long, and I know it's probably going to completely change the game. Anyway, let me know how you guys would rank these worlds in the comments. I imagine I'll probably get a fair amount of backlash for not having Dark Souls 1 at the top, but we'll see. Regardless, thanks for watching if you made it this far, and I'll see you guys in the next one.